don't think people are, you know, resting on their laurels, hoping happiness is going to show up. I think people are actively working towards this stuff. They're just kind of going at it the wrong way. Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today, we welcome Dr. Laurie Santos on the show. Dr. Santos is a psychology professor and head of Silliman College at Yale University. Her course, Psychology and the Good Life, is Yale's most popular course in over 300 years and has been adapted into a free Coursera program that has been taken by over 3.3 million people to date. Dr. Santos is a winner of numerous awards, both for her science and teaching from institutions such as Yale and the American Psychological Association. She's also the podcast host of The Happiness Lab. In this episode, I talked to Dr. Santos about happiness. People are unhappy, not for lack of trying, but it's because they're applying ineffective strategies. Dr. Santos identifies some of the cognitive biases that can hinder our happiness. There's no magical antidote to our problems, but there are ways to boost well-being in small but significant ways. We also discuss resilience, social justice, and mindfulness. It was great to catch up with Wari, who I've known from my graduate school days. I've long respected her work, and it's been really great watching her amazing developmental trajectory within her career. So without further ado, I bring you Dr. Laurie Santos. Laurie Santos. Wow. It's so great to have you on the Psychology Podcast. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Yeah. Um, you're, you're such a superstar now. <laughs> And you were a superstar in my eyes um, when I was a grad student uh, over 10 years ago. It's amazing how time flies. It is indeed, yes. Somehow you look the same. (laughs) (laughs) Same, same, same. Podcasting podcasting treats you well, you know, I think for both of us, we're looking great. (laughs) Really? Do I look recognizable at least? Uh, Yes, definitely, Um, definitely. And you were a superstar in my eyes for uh, a different reason than why you're a superstar today. Um, That was, I loved your work on uh, cognitive processes in non-human animals. I mean, loved your research during then. And I didn't even know at that time that you were interested in happiness. And, 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 and I wasn't even interested in happiness then. So I didn't, I should say, I didn't know that I would become interested in happiness. So I just bring this up to, to start because both of us are kind of, um, I want to bond here for a second here with you, because I feel like both of us started were unusual within the positive psychology world, because, you know, I'm a cognitive scientist, right? You're a cognitive developmental psychologist who then got interested in positive psychology. And I think that's a little quite different than a lot of people in the field of positive psychology who start off in that field and maybe don't have the, the background on the brain and, um, and, and, and cognitive development. So I just wanted to kind of start off there. It's an interesting journey. Yeah, no, same. I mean, if you had told me back then when you were a grad student, I was first starting at Yale that I'd be studying happiness. I'd be like, what? Like monkey happiness? Like, what are you talking about? So, um, yeah, it's been an interesting yeah. journey. So, um, catch me up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't even know at what point, what year were you like, oh, I'm going to teach a course in happiness at Yale. I don't even know when that, like how that, the origin story of that. Yeah, yeah. So, it, it started when I took on a new role on Yale's campus. So, I became a, a head of college, right? So, um, for, for those that don't know, Yale is one of these weird schools like Hogwarts and Harry Potter, where there's like colleges within a college. There's like, you know, the Yale Gryffindor, Yale Slytherin. Um, I became head of Silliman College. And that means... In that role, I was living on campus with students, right? Like I moved into their quad. I had a house like in the midst of students. I was eating in the dining hall and hanging out in the coffee shop. And I was expecting college student life to be like what college student life was like when I went to college, you know, in the late 90s. You know, I expected students, you know, to have their issues, but to to generally be kind of happy and not so stressed and enjoying college life. And that just like was not what I saw on the ground. Like, you know, I just saw incredible numbers of students who were depressed or anxious or just stressed out. You know, I'd run into students, even students who weren't struggling that much, you know, in in the quad and say, hey, how's it going? And they'd say, oh, if I could just fast forward to midterms or if I could just get to the summer. And, you know, it was heartbreaking, right? Here's this community that I'm supposed to be this like benevolent aunt for. And I was just watching students, students struggle, watching them fast forward this like precious short college experience. And, you know, it just struck me that, you know, we weren't necessarily necessarily giving students the right strategies to navigate this stuff, right? And which is kind of odd, you know, I mean, it also caused me to look really carefully at the national statistics on what's going on on college campuses. And like, right now, over 40% of college students report being too depressed to function over 60% say they're overwhelmingly anxious, more than one in 10 has seriously considered suicide in the last 12 months, like, this was, again, this is not Yale, this is nationally. And so I was saying, like, whoa, I had no idea things were as bad as they were. And 
And that really kind of jolted me. I was like, you know, I'm not, I'm not teaching them anything if, if 60% of the students in my classroom are so overwhelmed and so anxious that they can't function, right? You know, if like, if one in five has probably had someone they know maybe seriously cons consider suicide, like these were just striking numbers. And so I said, we got to do something about this. Like our, our psychology colleagues were like resting on their laurels and not like taking action here. And so that was when I kind of retrained. I mean, my goal was to really just retrain enough that I could develop this introductory class on strategies that students could use to feel happier. Mm -hmm. But then it kind of, it got, it got bigger than that. It got bigger than that in part because the class got bigger than I expected. Um, I expected, you know, 30 or so kids to take this, this new weird class on strategies for improving happiness. But a quarter of the entire campus showed up the first time I tried to teach it. Uh, we had to teach it uh, in a concert hall, Woolsey Hall, which you might remember on campus. Um, yeah, I do. Yeah. And so that was a minor logistical nightmare. Um, but it, it also taught me that students are like voting with their feet. They don't like this culture of feeling stressed and anxious. And I think they, they really wanted to do something about it. They wanted to do something about it in like an evidence-based way. They were like, what does the science say? Are the kinds of strategies we can use? Give them to me and I will put them into practice. Yeah. What year was that? This was in 2018, which is also kind of funny is not the right word. Ironic, maybe like, you know, prescient, like, you know, to be talking about well-being in college students before mm. the COVID-19 pandemic, right? Like I was worried about wow. their levels of depression and anxiety then. And, you know, everything has changed since then. Oh, yeah. I, I experienced the same thing. I started teaching at uh, Positive Psychology at Penn in 2016 um, while Angela Duckworth was writing her book, Grit. She said, Scott, do you want to teach my course? And I was like, sure. And then it ended up becoming a whole thing that I just loved of doing so much. And I could see firsthand how unbelievably stressed these students are. And um, and, and I think it's complex. Um, and I wanted to just have an honest, open conversation with you about it. I think there's a one hand and the other hand here. Um, I do see a lot more that teachers, uh, that professors can, can do to um, help students and um, have more compassion for all the, 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 the balls they have to juggle, you know, and all the things they have to do. But on the other hand, I'm also starting to see a little bit of a rise in entitlement to happiness among the students. And I wanted to hear your thoughts if you, if, if you know what I mean. If you, maybe that's not happening at Yale, but I think it, it's got to be happening at Yale if it's happening at Columbia. An expectation that, well, I should be happy. Um, and part of my training and teaching in my course is actually to, uh, to, to not think necessarily that way, you know, life doesn't really owe you anything. Um, but um, it, it sure would be nice to help the students. And uh, of course, but I, so I think there's a little, it's a little complex there. And I wanted to get some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, this, this, I think, fits with some of the ways that I teach the, the happiness class at Yale, you know, the class starts with this idea that our minds lie to us when it comes to happiness, right? There, there's so many ways that we get happiness wrong. And I think one of them is just that, that we think, we should be happy all the time, that it's normative right. to be happy all the time, right? That, that one could even, something's it is even possible, you. something's wrong with you if you're mm. not happy all the time. Mm. And, and that I think, you know, it's partly a lie of our mind, but it's partly comes from, you know, the, the culture today. I think there really is an idea of toxic positivity, right? The ne ooh, negative emotions, you've done something wrong. Like you're feeling anxious, you're feeling scared, like, you know, you must be broken, like do something about that, right? And I think one of the things we talk about a lot in the class is that negative emotions are, well, first of all, they're normative, right? They're just part and parcel of a like a, a real good human life. But beyond that, there are these important signals that we need to pay attention to. It's important to start seeing negative emotions like any other negative physical sensation. Like if you stick your hand on a hot stove, that's an important signal that you're supposed to do something. You're supposed to move your hand. If you're feeling lonely, if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling angry, those are in some ways normative responses to certain situations, but they're also really good signposts that you might need to do something different, that you might need to behave differently. And so I, I too kind of get the sense that one of the misconceptions is like, oh, I'm feeling a little depressed and mopey, you know, in the context of COVID-19, something must be broken. Why am I not happy all the time? And I think one of my goals is to clear up some of those misconceptions that you know, happy, happiness isn't something you get all the time. It's also not a destination, right? Um, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm fond of telling my students this lovely quote from Dan Gilbert, a psych psychology professor at Harvard, who says, happily ever after only works if you have six minutes to live. <laughs> you know, it doesn't, it's not like a, you know, a permanent solution there. That's so funny. He is so witty. That guy is so witty. <laughs> so I, I think I need to step back and, and just ask you how you even define happiness. Maybe I, that should have been my first question, but um, I think there's different conceptualizations of it within the field. So uh, what's your definition of it? 
Yeah, I kind of use the definition that that Sonia Lubomirsky, who's another positive psychologist, uses. She talks about happiness as uh, being happy in your life and being happy with your life. So I think of being happy in your life as having a decent ratio of positive to negative emotions. It's not no negative emotions. It's not positive emotion, you know, happiness emoji all the time. But it's like generally having a decent ratio of things like laughter and joy to things like, you know, sadness, anger, and so on. That's happy in your life. But then happy with your life is is separate, right? It's the answer to the question, all things considered, how satisfied are you with your life? It's a sense of purpose and meaning and kind of a bigger picture. And I like that definition for for two reasons. One is, I think it shows you that these things dissociate, right? Like you can be totally happy in your life and have all these wonderful hedonic experiences and positive emotions and just be completely empty when it comes to, you know, purpose and what you're doing with your life. Um, And it also shows that, you know, these are the other reason I like these definitions is that my read is that many of the interventions we have to improve happiness, many of the things we can do with our behaviors and our thought patterns to feel better, they wind up intervening on both of these constructs, right? Like they wind up increasing your positive emotions or decreasing your negative emotions in some, but not all cases. And I think they wind up making you a little bit more satisfied with your life. So that's the one we tend to use. And it's also worth noting that that leaves out a lot, a lot of the ways I think our culture characterizes happiness, but I think it's pretty good from a social science perspective. Yeah, I've always been in awe of how predictive, from a scientific point of view, a one-item life satisfaction questionnaire survey can be. I mean, <laughs> it's like one item, right? Like, how satisfied are you with your life? And I've read some really technical justification papers justifying why that's actually probably the best measure, uh, probably better than objective, because people in the field are like, well, why can't we have objective, me- you know, self-reports unreliable? Well, it's like, yeah, but maybe that's the, ex- the exception is when it comes to life satisfaction things. I want to know how you're experientially experiencing the world. Is that redundant to say that? But, yeah, no, you know, how you're yeah. experiencing... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're with me. You're with me. I, I use that phrase all the time. Yeah. No, I think, I think, I mean, yeah, I, I too, I mean, especially coming from, you know, the work with animals, right, where, you know, there've been yeah. these long debates about what can count as a real explanation and what can count as a real method. You know, when I kind of came to the happiness work and I'm like, okay, where's, you know, where are our methods? And it's like, you just ask people. And I'm like, what you just asked it's like a, a buzzfeed quiz that's the entire you know, of your like empirical method exactly but i kind of you know i came around i mean i came around in part you know because all this stuff you know right which is that these self-report measures correlate with a ton of things that you might think of as like slightly more objective right you know if i take all your tweets and I do machine learning on them to pull out the emotion words. If I do these detailed like friend and family interviews, Mm -hmm. you know, in in cases where we have, you know, biological constructs, which for the most part we don't for happiness or positive emotion, but in cases where we have things we could look at like cortisol or things like that, these things tend to correlate with it. But it, you know, so I came around to like, oh, maybe this isn't a silly BuzzFeed quiz. It really is a, like a detailed scientific like construct that we can be using or not a construct, a detailed kind of scientific method for testing um, how you're really feeling. Yeah. It's also just an interesting intellectual exercise to think through. Well, um, let's say we could develop an objective well-being measure as opposed to subjective well-being. Okay. What would that even mean? First of all, but second of all, what if it clashes with the, what if it's like, does it, what if you disagree? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> What, Your what happiness Trump's thermometer what? is saying that you're yeah. only at a 98.6 on yeah. happiness. I'm like, no, I, I feel great. So, yeah. Like, are you allowed to like trump what the test says? It's almost, I, I think of all as well with my whole work and I start off in intelligence. What if my actual intelligence that I'm in the real world, you know, it like defies what you predicted my intelligence would be based on your IQ test, you know? So I'm kind of like thinking of it a little bit analogous. What would that even mean? I think the subjective is a lot more powerful in a lot of ways, um, uh, exactly how you are experiencing the world. And sometimes people can experience the world positively, even if, people all around them are experiencing it negatively. And that's fascinating too. I mean, that's the whole resilience literature. And then, you know, George Bonanno and my colleague at Columbia doing great work on that, you know, but like what explains how and why in certain environments, um, some people act one way and in other environments, people act another way. What have you come across in your research and your personal experiences with the students that are the best predictors of that kind of resiliency to whatever life throws at you? I think, honestly, my sense is that it's the kind of strategies they use. I mean, I've really come around to think that, you know, there are behaviors we can engage in that make us feel better. There are thought patterns we can engage in to make us feel better. And a lot of that's 
for, for many people, that's really intentional. I think, you know, there, there is obviously, you know, heritable differences in happiness. There's some part of the variance out there in the world and people's well-being that's explained by, you know, what genes you happen to get in the lucky gene lottery, right? Um, but, but I think my sense is that people who tend naturally to have a higher subjective well-being, they just tend naturally to do the behaviors that, like, wind up improving your happiness. You know, I have this one friend who I went in my brain when I think of like, oh, you know, this happy person, I t- tend to think of this one friend of mine, it's the, the wife of one of my, my college friends. And I think of what she does naturally. And she's naturally like just the most grateful person ever. Like she's naturally like the most social person ever. I don't think I've ever heard of a night when she's like plopped down and watched Netflix. Like, you know, she, she's not like a, you know, a fitness freak, but she like moves her body with regular frequency. She sleeps like she just does all the things that like, you know, if I was like listing all the criteria that people should engage in to feel yeah. better, she does it naturally. Um, Hardwired. Into yeah. Her, yeah. What's funny is people often assume, you know, now that I'm this newfound, you know, like happiness teacher that I do this stuff naturally. And I'm like, hell no, (laughs) like I like my instincts are the opposite. I think this is one of the reasons that the students resonate with me teaching this stuff. And my, my podcast listeners resonate is like, my instincts are exactly the wrong ones. So I kind of get it. If you're struggling, it's like, Nope. I, I, I also think that it would be better to, you know, be solo and just like leisurely watch TV. I also think I definitely don't want to move my body. I also think, you know, like every single negative thing you could be doing. I'm like, yep, that's my instinct. But I think part of doing better is to overcome those instincts is to recognize that your intuitions might be leading you astray. Yeah, I, it's funny you brought that up because I was going to ask you after all these years teaching this, how has it impacted your happiness personally? And I'm sure you get that question all the time, but I am curious, like how it, it must change you even in small ways that add up over time that maybe you're not fully aware of. But No, totally. Um, no, I'm, I'm aware. I mean, you know, Scott, I'm a nerd. Mm-hmm. Like I like do my own little perma like, once a month to just check yeah. how it's going. And, and honestly, I have, I, I've gone up on like a, you know, a standard 10 point ish happiness scale you know about a point Mm -hmm. right so it's it's not like these practices take you from zero to a hundred that's not their goal right i think it's you know small but significant movements upward and i definitely have experienced that but i've experienced that in part because i do a lot more of these behaviors you know when you teach a class on this stuff your students will love to call you out like if one of my students sees me in the Silliman courtyard and i'm like on my phone and not talking to someone, they'll say, Hawk Santo, our, our title is head of college. So I'm Hawk Santo. It's like, Hawk Santo is like, I thought you weren't supposed to be on your phone. <laughs> or like, or if my podcast producer catches me like beating myself up and not engaging in self-compassion, he'll just send like little emojis that are like, hey, like just a reminder, like not supposed to do that. You know, you, you have a whole freaking episode on this. You know, you got to love these students. You know, they're just like, it's just... Uh, I'm like, oh, you know, it's it's such a privilege we have, first of all, to be able to transform their lives in in, in meaningful ways. Like, I'm very grateful for that opportunity. Um, um, They're also very, um, uh, well, I'm sure it's at Yale as well, but at Barnard College, very social justice oriented. They're very social justice oriented. So, you know, uh, a conversation that continually comes up in the classroom, and I'm wondering if this, this has come up in your classroom, is, well, they're like, well, Professor Kaufman, you know, uh, what about systemic issues, right? What about like structural issues? And like, does this work that we're doing invalidate that in some way or say that it's not important? And we always, it always leads to a really rich discussion in my classroom. And I'm like, well, we need to stop the either or thinking, you know, like life, it's not, let, let's change even the phrasing of that question. But, but that question always comes up, you know, and uh, I'm wondering, has that come up in your classroom? Oh yeah, definitely. How I have mean, you dealt with it? Yeah, yeah. definitely. I mean, yeah. you know, I try to, you know, also make it clear that we're not talking about either or, but, but also that it's, it's not even not either or there is an important synergy mm. and a balance that comes from thinking about both mm. of these issues at the same time. I actually cover um, some, some work really looking at the extent to which happier people engage more in social justice stuff. This is a uh, work by Costa Kushleff and his colleagues that looks at this directly, right? They, they go and look at people who go to a Black Lives Matter protest or people who go to a climate change rally and they measure people's level of well-being. So they they survey, for example, in one study, they surveyed all these UVA students right after that kind of nasty white supremacist incident. And they asked, hey, did you donate money to Black Lives Matter? Did you do something? Right. And what they find is that the people who are taking action are the ones who are have the, have the highest self-reported subjective well-being. So the idea of subjective well-being gives you kind of the bandwidth to like, not be, you know, in your house, like eating ice cream, when you feel like the world's falling apart, you actually go out and do something. They did similar studies on on climate change, right? So they look at who's worried about climate change. And what you find is that people who have lower levels of self-reported 
uh, subjective well-being are more worried about climate change, right? It makes sense. You're just miserable at everything and climate change looms really large. You feel really anxious about it. But then they say, okay, well, who donated money to climate change? Who went to a protest? Who did anything? And what you find is exactly the opposite pattern, right? So people who have that self-reported highest levels of subjective well-being are doing stuff. And so I share this, this study with students because I say, you know, like, you know, you're the future, Yale students, like, you know, college students, you're the future. But like, if you're all so miserable that 60% of you are, you know, so anxious that you can't function most days, like, you're not going to get out there and fix these problems. And so, so I think it's not, I think we need to move students away, not just from the either or, but to recognize there's a synergy here, right? Um, you know, you can actually help more if you're taking care of yourself. Uh, you know, the, the, the African American poet Audre Lorde talked about, you know, that self care is a political act, right? And I think, taking care of your own health through positive psychology interventions, you can also consider a political act, right? And so, so that's one, that's yeah. kind of one way to, to deal with it. The, the other is just to, to recognize that, again, these structural changes are so needed, but they're, they're not inexpensive, this stuff, right? Like there's, there's no reason we can't be doing both of these at the same time. Yeah, I love that. The trauma, loss, and uncertainty of our world have led many of us to ask life's biggest questions, such as who are we? What is our highest purpose? And how do we not only live through, but thrive in the wake of tragedy, division, and challenges to our fundamental way of living? To help us all address these questions, process what this unique time in human history has meant for us personally and collectively, and emerge whole, I've collaborated with my colleague and dear friend, Dr. Jordan Feingold, MD, to bring you our forthcoming book. It's called Choose Growth a workbook for transcending trauma, fear, and self-doubt. It's a workbook designed to guide you on a journey of committing to growth and the pursuit of self-actualization every day. It's chock full of research from humanistic psychology, positive psychology, developmental psychology, personality psychology, cognitive science, and neuropsychology. So lots of themes that you hear about on this podcast. And it's aimed to help us all integrate the many facets of ourselves and co-create our new normal with a renewed sense of strength, vitality, and hope. Whether you're healing from loss, adapting to the new normal, or simply looking ahead to life's next chapter, Choose Growth will help steer you there to deeper connection to your values, your life vision, and ultimately your most authentic self. Choose Growth will officially hit the shelves September 13th, and you can order your copy or the audiobook in the US now on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, and all major retailers. If you're in the UK and Commonwealth, you can order now at bookshop.org.uk. We truly hope this book helps you grow and thrive and become your best self. Okay, now back to the show. There's a lot of things that uh, were raised uh, with what you just said, so I'm trying to like think, which one was first? Something interesting I find about uh, the subjective well-being research is that that one item, um, you know, someone may think, oh, well, what happiness, like, surely that just means hedonism. Surely that just means, you know, feeling good all the time. But even the data itself shows, and it didn't have to be this way. This is how the data came out. It shows that uh, subjective well-being is much more strongly correlated with pro-social purpose than hedonism. So I think that just just telling people that, right. like you know, because they, it's not like even like we're top down saying the theory is that that yeah. that uh, that that purpose is more uh, gives you greater life satisfaction than hedonism. We're saying this is what the data shows. Right. Do you know and what I mean? I, you know, we start we start with, you know, our, our mutual colleague when we were at Yale, Peter Salve's idea of the feel good, do good uh, effect, right? Which yeah. is just like mm -hmm. if you are in a better mood, you do nicer stuff, right? <laughs> like and it's like <laughs> so yeah, I, I think it's funny. I mean, I think again, you know, th these are students who are facing these structural issues head on for the first time, you know, in, in college and I think are learning about them, are learning how important they are. So I think it makes sense that they're like, wait, what about this? And I think the key is just to recognize like like all these structural issues are solved by individuals with a certain set of like psychological processes. And so we just need to remember that to fix these things, we need to pay attention to those psychological processes and the kind of psychological bandwidth and resilience that people are bringing with them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing that I, I felt has been remiss in the field of positive psychology is, uh, is integration with the fields of personality psychology the fields of developmental psychology. I mean, how is it not better integrated with the field of developmental psychology and the field of cognitive science? Um, this has just been something I've been just like it. Like I go to the conferences, right? I go, I go to IPA, 
And I'm like, there's no developmental psychologist at this entire conference, but how is that possible? Right. So like just the question of how do these things develop seems to be so important as opposed to just like taking, having people take the questionnaire and then, and then just seeing where, where they're at. Um, where do you think, uh, the non-genetic component, we don't need to go into the genetic component, <laughs> but the non-genetic, <laughs> the non-genetic component of, um, developing happiness. What are the, the main environmental sources you think that, that really comes from? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think they're from a lot of different places. I mean, I think one way to answer that question, especially when we think about those scary statistics I just talked about in college students is to ask, you know, how, where did those kind of terrible statistics come from, right? And I think one thing mm -hmm. to know about those statistics is they've gotten really much worse, even just over the last 10 and 20 years. In fact, that statistic about college student depression, my understanding is that has, has doubled since 2012, which is kind of terrifying. And so one could then flip the question on its head and say, okay, well, what has changed in the last 10 or 20 years that's causing some of these like really devastating mental health outcomes? And I think we could point our fingers a bunch of different ways, right? You know, I think mm -hmm. if you, if you plot the slope of college student depression and you plot the slope of cell phone use or social media use, you know, mm -hmm. the lines line up in a very, you know, scary, I know correlation mm -hmm. doesn't equal causation, but this looks really close kind of way. We also see, you know, the, I think this is also the time when achievement culture is kicking in in a really incredible way, right? You know, since the 80s of No Child Left Behind and the U.S. News and World Report college rankings, I think, you know, the idea of student achievement has just been at the forefront in a way that causes many students before they get to college to like, you know, not be sleeping enough, not prioritize their friendships, like pr prioritize achievement and grades at all costs. And I think these cultural factors are really impacting, you know, the psychological development of our young people, honestly, and in many ways, in ways we don't really understand. And so I don't know if there's like a red herring of like, here's the one thing that has caused these changes over time. But I think it's important to start looking at these things to figure out, like, how did this change? And how did it change so rapidly? Yeah, absolutely. And, and then, you know, we could, of course, talk all day nerding out about the genetics and coactive, you know, variation where people or genes can subtly influence us to make certain choices, which in the long run do add up to happiness or uh, the feeling of, of being happy or uh, a feeling of being satisfied with one's life um, through the own sort of act of Sorry, the active process, not just the passive process. So that that's interesting too. But all this stuff are deep, deeply intertwined. Uh, you know, culture, environment, genes. Yeah. I mean, I think as we get, you know, as there's a recognition that we need to pay attention to well-being even more, and that it's a scientific pursuit. I mean, I think that's another misconception that a lot of people have. It's like some fluffy woo thing that we leave to the like you know, I don't know, woo, Gwyneth Paltrow type people to like talk about happiness, right? right? We realize like, no, 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 this is like a real true scientific basis of study. Then we can start yeah. like d doing a deeper dive into some of the epigenetics using the kind of really cool tools that we have now that I understand way less well than you do, but that you can tell us what we should be doing uh, on the genetic side. <laughs> well, uh, who's at Yale right now uh, uh, that is studying the, the science of well-being besides you? Is there, who's at Yale right now? I mean, we have lots of folks who are doing. Catch me the, up. Yeah, yeah, not many. I mean, honestly, I think there's there's a lot of folks doing the like when when things go downhill, you know, clinical mental health side, right? But but not as many people doing positive psychology. Uh, you know, which is kind of interesting. You know, I put you know Peter in the camp of doing some really pivotal work on you know this feel good do good effect and emotional intelligence. Um, but yeah, not as many like card carrying positive psychologists as you'd expect. That's a shame. That's a shame. I always, uh, you know, may he rest in peace, but one of my advisors, Jerome L. Singer, you know, I always found his work relevant, like daydreaming and creativity. And I loved how he infused that into clinical psychology. And, uh, and I, I love the emerging field of pot. Po oh, sorry, go on. No, I was going to say, and I think, you know, I think, you know, I'm saying there's, there's not any card carrying positive psychologists, but I don't think they're the only ones that are strongly contributing to work in the, in the domain of kind of happiness science. Like, I mean, we have people at Yale who yeah. are looking at the neuroscience of mindfulness and meditation, people like Heidi Kober, right? Mm. Um, you know, we have philosophers who are thinking about the good life and, and how we use imagination and fiction, people like Tamar Gendler who are thinking about this stuff. So I think even though Yale doesn't have, you know, folks who might go to, 
IPA and all these kind of, you know, like I'm a positive psychologist and that's who I am. We have people, you know, who are adjacent who are really thinking about these questions more broadly. And honestly, you know, maybe this is just, you know, a show of my heritage of not, you know, growing up as a positive psychologist in the same way you didn't grow up as a positive psychologist. I think that's where the real answers are going to come from. I look at the work yeah. that I find most exciting right now, and, and it's often done by people who didn't you know, grow, grow up in that field, people like Liz Dunn, people like Mike Norton, people like Nick Epley, who are, you know, doing this great work about social connection and money and how it impacts our happiness. And, you know, they don't necessarily go to these conferences either, but I think they have really important things to say. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, it's a funny idea. I didn't grow up in, in positive psychology. And I know what you mean. Um, well, I was just going to make some jokes, like, just like, yeah, like if positive psychology is, is your core identity and like I'm a positive psychologist, that's a certain vibe. <laughs> I don't know. That's a vibe. Well, this kind of came up, you know, I, like I think, you know, uh, I got in the midst of, you know, the, when I taught this class, it was really like white knuckling, like, you know, with thousands of students. I didn't expect it. it was the first time I was teaching the class. We had the press there, you know, so I'm like checking my PowerPoint for time typos because the first time I made the PowerPoint one, like the Today Show is there or something. I'm like, ah, but it, the, the class got this tremendous amount of press. And I think it's just like anything Yale does is going to get press. Yale is just one of these places that like anything that happens on campus, the New York Times is going to show up. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I guess there was a lot of discourse among the positive psychologists about like, who's, you know, who's this chick that she's going to come in and like, you know, be in the New York Times or being a positive psychologist. She's not really one of us. Um, and in fact, it was Marty Seligman forwarded me this kind of thread that was on one of these news, you know, like kind of like group, group lists. Um, and he's like, well, let's, yeah. let's let Lori speak for herself on this. And it was funny to see all these, you know, so-called positive psychologists. In fact, it was one researcher who studied humility. who was like, who is this, you know, <laughs> who is this interloper who's yeah. coming in, yeah. you know, and I wrote back and I'm like, you know, like, A, I think we can retrain, right. You know, and it's helpful to have people. Yeah. You know, I think some of the best people doing animal work are people who weren't necessarily trained in the comparative cognition yeah. tradition right you do bring other things i was like second like you know i'm not like showing up and trying to get a job in positive psychology i'm just like teaching an undergrad class that was how this all started right um and then yeah i mean i didn't say in, in a third, lot of ways i didn't say like in third you study humility dude like <laughs> like come on but i didn't say yeah that i know, part, but, you know i know yeah. Yeah, in a lot of ways, like, I mean, it's, it's like, I didn't choose this life, this life chose me, folks, yeah, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Like you wanted to start out with like a 30 person seminar, you know? Yeah. I can't even imagine, like, um, the, it must have felt like a circus at the, at the, that to have the, the media there, to have that many students. I mean, what did that feel like? Do you feel like, did you feel like a rock star? Like, at, at, like uh, you know, performing at like <laughs> uh, one of these big exhausted. festivals? <laughs> I mostly felt mm, exhausted. Mm, um, mm. Yeah, it, it, there's a kind of deep irony about this path to happiness about, you know, apart from, you know, students calling me out and me doing more of these practices myself, whether or not mm. the busyness that came with this is really helpful for my happiness. And one thing I talk about a lot in the class is time affluence. I um, mean, you know, this is a lovely work that Ashley Wilson's another kind of non card carrying psychologist who's doing really great work in positive psychology. You know, she finds that, you know, our, our sense of having free time um, it was really matters for our well being, much more so than our wealth affluence, our time affluence matters a lot. And I think if there's one thing that's taken a major hit <laughs> since I started doing a lot of this happiness work, it's my, it's my time affluence. So. Um, and especially true that semester. It was a rough time, a little bit of a surreal time. Um, but, but again, it's put me on this path. You know, I think, you know, I loved doing the work with primates and that was amazing. You know, I still have a lab that does some of that stuff. But just the impact that you can have teaching people about these concepts and hearing the emails about people like, oh, I tried, you know, social connection as you suggested, or I tried a gratitude list and like, it's really changed my life. Like there's this sense that I'm doing something that's a, a meaningful in a different way than the work I was doing before and definitely reaching way more people than I was reaching before. And that feels pretty good. 100%. Well, I'm glad you didn't feel imposter syndrome or at least you didn't feel it enough to prevent you from going for it. Oh, I definitely felt um, it, but it I didn't, like, feel, it, like, I didn't yeah. feel it enough. It, it so, didn't yeah. stop you. It didn't <laughs> stop you. And uh, because you, just look how many students you've helped. Like, look how much. And in a lot of ways, um, it must be very, very worrying for you. I don't need to ask. Like, it's more worrying than, than the, the capuchins you've changed pr their lives. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I will guess that um, it has been very meaningful for you and really you know i imagine they send you uh, cards at the end of the semester right like oh th this is actually a really funny story of it, not just my yale students because we've now put that class online as one of yale's online digital offerings on coursera.org it's called the science of well-being um and four million people have taken it which is completely 
no big a little deal. bit. Yeah. Like <laughs> nuts to me, but, um, but I had this funny situation. So, you know, cut to like, you know, like August of 2020, everything's shut down. Like no one's been in the office for forever. I haven't been in the office for forever. And this was around the time that some of the staff were coming back. And I get this email from one of the administrators in the psych office. You remember these lovely folks who were like so kind and nice and Mm -hmm. and never, never have a harsh word. But one of them had a harsh word for me. They were like, you got to come in and empty your mailbox. Your mailbox is overflowing. You need to get in here like right now. And, And I was like, what? And so by go in and you remember the little cubbies we used to have. So for folks that don't yeah, know the psych department, these little cubbies. So my cubby was full. The The whole little bench under my cubby was full and it had spilled onto the floor. And it was just cards and letters and artwork by people who'd taken the online class that like, you uh-huh. know, when I tell you there was like a teary afternoon when I went, well, first of all, it was like impossible to carry back. I had to make two trips to the department to get all these cards and letters, but it's beautiful. Wow. I mean, when you see that you're really impacting people, uh, yeah, it's just mm. amazing. It's just amazing. So you've really in recent years really been interested in this idea of how we lie to ourselves. Um, what are some of the other things we lie to ourselves about. Can you tell me some of the things that are for, for forefront of your mind right now? Yeah, I mean, you know, so many things. And I think this is a spot where the, the work on happiness really aligns closely with my work on capuchins in a very weird way. I mean, but back in the day, I was really interested in whether or not these cognitive errors that we have as humans are shared with monkeys. And we looked at things like loss aversion. We looked at things like cognitive dissonance. We looked at like, we looked at all these kind of classic biases to see, are these things built in? Are these things that are evolved? Are they going to be hard to overcome? And I think this is the the kind of perspective that I've taken on a lot of the happiness work is that a lot of the reason we're not as happy as we could be isn't because we're not trying. We're putting in tons of effort. We're just like doing it wrong. And I think we're doing it wrong in part because we don't think about happiness the right way. We have these cognitive biases when it comes to, to happiness and achieving happiness. And so, you know, one of the big ones is that we don't realize our minds get used to stuff. You know, we assume that, you know, we're going to buy the next gadget and we'll be happy forever. And you know, we get married, we get that new promotion at work, mm. and we'll be happily ever after. You know, this, this term that we just shown is wrong. You know, Tal Ben Shahir calls this um, the arrival fallacy, right? You know, it's like we think we're going to mm. get there and we're going to be good forever, but not so. Um, and that's in part because not just because of hedonic adaptation, but because we're blind to hedonic adaptation. We don't realize that we get used to stuff over time. Um, I think another bias of our mind is that we, you know, we assume that, we pay attention to things in absolute terms that if I get absolutely more money or absolutely more success, I'd feel happier. But in practice, that's just not how our mind looks at things. Our minds are big relative machines. We just compare against some random reference point and that's how we feel. And stupidly, our minds are very good at picking random reference points that make us feel terrible. This is like, in a way, you're kind of like, you're like adding on to the cognitive biases list, you know, like you're adding things within the realm of um, things that have more direct implications for our happiness. I don't know if you thought about it that way at all within that framework, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think, you know, I'm not the one who's identified these biases, right? I'm just synthesizing Mm -hmm. the great work, you know, in the case of hedonic adaptation of Dan Gilbert, you know, and, you know, social comparison, tons of folks, including Kahneman and Tversky, who thought about this and, you know, won a Nobel Prize Mm -hmm. in part for this stuff, right? But, but I think, you know, the way I think about it is, you know, these aren't just kind of haphazard ways that our minds work. These could be deep-seated structural ways that our minds work, just like the kinds of things I was studying in Capuchins. And that means they're going to be hard to overcome, that merely understanding these mechanisms doesn't mean that you somehow can avoid them. And I think that's really important. That kind of changes the calculus of like, okay, how do we deal with these things, right? We have to kind of work with our biases instead of against them. Mm. Oh, yeah, awareness. Ah. So important awareness, so important, um, which which actually does lead me uh, to a discussion of the latest science of mindfulness, because I mean I think that some of the claims are a bit overhyped. Um, of some of these mindfulness programs, um, when you actually look at the data, you're like, you see a much more circumscribed um, set of things that um, that that has reliably been uh, that mindfulness produces. I was wondering where you kind of stand on that. What your thoughts are about the latest science of mindfulness and what it shows its its benefits are. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, mindfulness is definitely not a panacea empirically, but none of these positive psychology interventions are right. My, my read is like. 
every single one of them in, in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases for most people, because of course, individual differences, I don't have to tell you about individual differences, but yes, individual differences, right? Um, it, like what they do is they on average give a small but consistent boost, right? I mean, if you look at like gratitude journaling that on average gives you a small but consistent boost, but you're looking at like, Again, it depends on the study, but you know, like not more than a point bump up on a 10 point happiness scale on average, right? The key though, is that for a lot of these, I think it, it's, and again, it's on average, right? Not everybody is necessarily going to show that bump. The key though, is I think that these things give us some tools that we can try out, right? We can try them out on ourselves and see, are these the kind of things that make us feel better? And I, and I put mindfulness in this category. If I try this, is it going to make me feel anxious? Am I going to hate it? Or is this going to like give me a little, give me a practice that allows me to be more present. That allows me to notice stuff that allows me to curb my mind wandering. Mm -hmm. And you got to do like the experiment for yourself. And, and, and I think, you know, to be fair, these small, but like, like significant and consistent happiness boosts, like I'll take them, you know, I'd much rather be a seven on a happiness scale than a six out of 10, you know, like out of mm -hmm. 10. Right. And so, yeah, but I think it is important. I think whenever these things get talked about in the popular media, they wind up like way more hyped than, you know, than, than the results often show. And I feel like that's not exactly the fault of the researchers, it might be the fault of some researchers, but most researchers, I think, are honest about the magnitude of their effect sizes. But then they get written about, you know, in these huge ways. But that's true. You know, I've never read any paper that like, you know, chocolate or coffee or wine and cancer is not like it will stop cancer. I'm like, pretty sure <laughs> like it's a overall average of a small percentage, you know? Yeah. I think it's very important to point that out that any specific exercise um, or targeting any one specific domain um, really doesn't move it that much more than one, two points. But I want to be a little more optimistic and say, yeah. Could it be? Wait, wait, that is it's optimistic. Like, like, I mean, like uh, that is a lot optimistic. Of these, I guess like, that is that's crazy. Okay, fair like, enough, fair like enough. if you if there was a like a drug company that had a pill that they were like, if anybody takes this pill, they're gonna go up one point on a ten point happiness scale. <laughs> that drug would make so much yeah. money, and we have that free drug. That's it's true. all these interventions. Yeah, that's true. But more optimistic. Don't let me stop you there. <laughs> I was gonna say, I was I was gonna say, I don't want people to then extrapolate that to mean that the most you can increase your happiness is only one to two points. Because I think the point here is the more um, exercise, the more you you make this a daily part of your life and you have it, um, you can su even more substantially uh, move the dial on your life satisfaction. So I just wanted to make that point. Just wanted to make that point. <laughs> I think this is one of the reasons I love Sonia Lubomirsky's work so much is, you know, she, yes. she talks about like, it's work, yo, like you gotta just like, yes. like put the work, like just like anything else. You know, I saw one of my students had, had posted a meme about, you know, it's like, like, you know, hopped on the treadmill for 15 minutes and I'm not a size, you know, extra small anymore, like you right. know, WTF. And I, and I think people think this with the happiness interventions too. It's like, I wrote in my gratitude journal, why am I still having <laughs> any joking? sadness? Uh, I mean, it was a joke. Yeah, it was a meme, right? Okay, it's like, you know, okay, but, but I think okay. we think, we think that with fitness, right? We're like, I went to the gym every day this week. Like what's going on? Like why, you know, like why can't I fit in my pants? And I think the same about happiness. We just assume, we want quick fixes, right? Our brain just, this is, I think another interesting bias of the brain is like, like, it's hard for us to see small incremental changes, you know, especially ones that, that don't go up in a linear slope that kind of go up and down over time. Like we just can't integrate that. Um, but that's what's happening with these interventions. If you, if you do them and you're consistent about them and you make them a daily practice, they do work in a small but significant way. At what point should people accept some things really won't change that much within themselves. And then actually for their happiness, that self-acceptance is actually the most important thing for them. I think about this all the time, you know, because it's like some things, you know, you would, would be happier if you put your efforts into something else, right? Like, for instance, some people are obsessed with their physical appearance, right? And it's like, actually, I, th I think you'd be a little happier if you uh, got more yep. obsessed about your pro-social purpose <laughs> than, than the yet another sort of facial, you know, reconstruction surgery. So I'm just trying to think about this and, and how we'll have you thought about that. 
Yeah. I mean, one of the things we talk about, the way I structure the class is we start with things that won't make you happier and things that will make you happier, you know, things that won't make yeah. you happier. You know, if you're living above the poverty line with a decent middle class income, more money is not going to make you happier. Um, you know, like you, body and looks, you know, there's so much evidence that in many cases, diet and weight loss, plastic surgery doesn't, you know, increase your happiness, at least in the way people are predicting, right? We make mm-hmm. incorrect affective forecasts about how good this stuff is going to ultimately feel, mm-hmm. right? And like, by and large, if your circumstances are reasonable, like changing them is not going to help. And so, you know, I explicitly point this stuff out to students. And this is the part where I get like the most student pushback. I mean, you deal with these, you know, smart Ivy League kids, right? Like they'll show up and be like, okay, but Hug Santa's like, what if, you know, I really make this much money and I donate this much? Like, you know, like, can then I get my like million dollar <laughs> investment banking job? So I think knowing what's not going to work is really important and really critical. And that way, again, you can start putting your energies towards the kind of stuff that really will improve your happiness. Again, it's not, I don't think people are, you know, resting on their laurels, hoping happiness is going to show up. I think people are actively working towards this stuff. They're just kind of going at it the wrong way. Nice. Very well put. Um, So what are some things you'll be talking about in the upcoming season of your podcast? Do we get any previews, coming attractions? Yeah. I hear there you have a really famous psychologist coming up uh, uh, whose name starts with an S. Scott. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. uh, yes uh you're actually you you will be featured not in the next season we have i, I want oh, to transcend gotcha. it to be its own episode so it's sitting there waiting oh, till we come gotcha. back for like a full interview show because i didn't want to mix and match you with other other folks so you're you're <laughs> waiting in the wings my transcendence episode which i love and we just haven't been able to do it yet this season is actually really fun um we're talking about the, the psychology of negative experiences why we sometimes like pain and fearful mm. things like haunted houses and so on um and so that's do you have paul gonna, bloom on we do have paul bloom on mm. um and we have this uh wonderful journalist uh lee cowart who like paul has mm. written a book about um like uh, things painful experiences and why they feel good but lee they have decided to um, experience all those experiences. So they ate like the world's hottest hot pepper and they, um, engaged very publicly in the book in like BDSM, like sex play. Like, so they like, unlike mm. Paul, like we, like they put like their money with their mouth. <laughs> it's like, they right, really right. like went for well, it. Well, you don't know about um, Paul. We chatted about that in the podcast. He said, you know, like, you know, if I, if I do engage in that stuff, I'm not going to talk about it in the book. So yeah, I'm like, that's yeah, right. That's enough. right. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah but yeah. why, why do we like that stuff? You know? And, and in some cases when we know yeah. it's fake, like, in the context of sad books and scary movies, why yeah. do we fall for it? We're mm-hmm. also doing uh, a whole episode on uh, fandom and why fandom oh, nice. can bring us happiness. Um, uh, this allows me, because I'm like a huge sci-fi nerd, to nerd out. We have Will We In on the show, um, who talks mm-hmm. about how being a geek isn't about what you love. It's about how you love it. And the happiness-inducing practices mm-hmm. of loving something like your life depends on it. So it's a little bit of a you know mixed bag uh, of all kinds of interesting things, but it's going to be a fun season. I love it. I love it. Well, congratulations to you. Um, I hope you're getting some real rest. Uh, I don't know if, if it's public knowledge that you're, t- you're uh, on sabbatical. Well, it was in the New York knowledge? Times. So, oh, okay. <laughs> like, so like, she's so that's... burned out. Like there's like the big <laughs> header in the New York. She's so burned out. Oh my gosh. Like, yeah, so oh, great. the thanks, media thanks. is ridiculous. In fact, you're my mom, paparazzi's, uh, my mother-in-law right wrote yeah. to me. She's like, I just read in the New York Times you're taking some time off. Like, are you going to tell me your mother-in-law? You know, so. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Well, I just really hope that this is a real restorative time for you. Um, and congratulations on um, all your successes and I and uh, also congratulations on it not going to your head. You're like the same, oh. you know, Laurie Santos that I remember from like a decade ago. I mean, you're, you know, humble and uh, and and sweet and and Aww. smart and <laughs> and funny. So yeah, it's just it's it's really nice to reconnect with you. And uh, thanks for being on my show today. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.